Hi guys, welcome to Digital Consciousness TV, where we take a really candid approach to interviewing some of the most amazing thought leaders of our time. And today I was certainly sitting on the edge of my seat interviewing uh, Barnett Bain. For those of you who haven't heard of Barnett Bain, he is an Oscar winning producer of movies like What Dreams May Come, The Celestine Prophecy, and also Homeless to Harvard. He is also working on an upcoming project on Eckhart Tolle's book called Milton's Secret. But also when I first heard about uh, Barnett Bain was through Cutting Edge Consciousness and I started listening to their interviews. And if you have not heard of Cutting Edge Consciousness, I highly recommend for you to go on there and listen to some of the stuff that they're doing. It's amazing. They interview some amazing people and really push the edge of, of the thought paradigm and, and uh, go and delve into some really interesting topics around conscious awareness. Uh, so I heard of him through, through those means. Um, but he is also, in amongst all of that and his busy life, he is also an amazing author and he's just brought out his book, The Book of Doing and Being. And what he does in that book is he shares some amazing principles and practices that are, that are at the leading edge. And he offers uh, life-altering maps that help us step beyond what it is that we already know and delve into, say, a dimension of imagination and that's where the innovation is born. So he's, he's a creativity expert in, in some respects and, uh, and very much known in that, in that space. So he, he has given us the amazing opportunity to speak to him so I can share this with you guys. And if you do like this, please like, share or subscribe and share the love um, because the message that he has to send and, and the conversation that is in there uh, is just and it's stimulating to the brain. It's just amazing. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. And we delve into some interesting topics. We unravel some interesting topics. And, uh, you know, if there, is, if there is something that is worth watching, this is it. So take a moment, uh, set aside some time, switch off the phone, and uh, enjoy the beautiful educational orchestral words uh, of Barnett Bain. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Barnett Bain, for joining us today on Digital Consciousness TV. I am so glad to be here with you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Good. Barnett Bain, the magician, the creator of igniting the light within those that are ready for an eye-opening journey of self. <laughs> Not only are you a well-accomplished author with your new masterpiece, The Book of Doing and Being, you're also a highly creative, creative uh, executive producer or respected producer um, with your latest production with The Milton Secret, which I can't wait to, um, to, to sort of see how that comes out with the, on the book by uh, Eckhart Tolle. I believe you're also one of the most insightfully aware interviewers of our time. You know, the way that you delicately orchestrate your words through con the conscious awareness world and um, in, in tie it into a beautiful melody of conscious awareness into the into the show, the radio show, um, Cutting Edge Consciousness. Wrapping this all up into your hero's journey, what would be the defining moment in your life that's brought you to this moment right now? Oh, I think it's the moment that I realized that there is something after the hero's journey that there's a post-heroic journey, that uh, there comes a point when um, being heroic and um, triumphing, there is a point at which there is a winning that is, there is a triumph that is more than winning. And then uh, it's no longer about being a hero in one's own story. There's something else that happens there. And I am in the exploration of that. And do you find that, that exploration um, of that in that in that journey? It just it's almost like going back into that um, the childlike state of wonder. And it's funny because my word this year, I pick a word every year um, to live by, and this word this year is um, adventure. So, so, so what has your adventure been so far for this year that led you to the book, uh, to get to the book uh, that you've now developed called The Book of Doing and Being? Um, well, I, first of all, I love that you referenced the wonder because it is about a childlike wonder. But there's nothing childish about it. It's, a, it's, it's similar to being a fool, but there's nothing foolish about it. 
there's a great wisdom to being a fool. There's a great sophistication in understanding the hero's journey and in understanding the mechanics enough, not perfectly, but enough. Understanding the mechanics of reality creation or that our experience is the product of our thought and belief and our choice and our decisions and our attitudes and our feelings and all of these sorts of things. And they're wonderful and we can become masterful at it. And when we become masterful at it, we uh, begin to realize not only as a head uh, understanding, but in the heart, and then not only in the heart, but as a full embodied understanding. We realize that we absolutely do create our reality 100%. And, and the knowing of that, in the deep knowing in that, in the very next instant, we realize we don't. But we can't do premature transcendence syndrome. So life is about becoming the hero of our journey in the knowing and in the understanding how we do create our own realities. And, then, and in what happens after we have a, a, an understanding of the mechanics of how we do it, we can be we can begin an exploration of being, mm. the field of the entire experience, and that is not of our doing anymore. So, it is um, a what? There's a wisdom about the the ways of the world. There's a deep wisdom that is a part and parcel of the hero's journey, and then there is a. Um, innocence that is childlike because the we don't part oh my goodness i don't create my reality it is received 110 percent as a gift mm. uh now i am a wise fool <laughs> that post-heroic journey and so my experience of it is similar you know when you said wonder it's very much about wonder mm. and for me it is also about enchantment the uh, whole of um, of my world the whole of our world mm. the experience of being a human being is one of enchantment there is only one thing going on it's <laughs> like looking at a diamond <laughs> Yeah. We're up so close, we can only see one facet. And as we pull back a little bit, yeah. see two facets, three facets, and realize there's a whole stone there cut in many facets. Yeah. And that the entire of our experience is always communicating to us. Every molecule of matter is freighted with meaning that is personal to every human, uh, to everything conscious on the planet. So everything is always in communication. And our opportunity is to tune into what is being communicated. Mm. And there's always a communication ready for exactly where we are. It's like tuning into your, you know, you put on your radio and you mm -hmm. tune into whatever the, whatever the bandwidth is. And yeah. there is, there's always something to meet you there. Yeah. So, to me, that is an experience of such enchantment. It's such an unspeakable enchantment. Mm, mm. It's a um, really energetic enchantment. I've spent my whole life as a story maker, personally and privately and professionally, and now I'm at a place where I am uh, less interested in story, although it's lots of fun to make story. <laughs> but I'm interested in story, and I'm more interested in what is the container that holds all stories what supersedes stories mm. what is the next thing and guess what it's not logical yeah the mind the mind is not calibrated to hold that kind of information yeah, yeah. that sort of information that sort of energy information we can't put a we can't put a human language to the meaning of it can we nor can we process it through the hard drive yes yeah yeah it is 
processed in a different magnitude of consciousness that is in that has to do with wonder mm. that has to do with enchantment that has to do with the oneness between you and I right now mm. there is a field although we are half a world away we're right here yeah yeah we're right now we can tune into it we are tuned into it this is a very different experience of uh, humanness than heroes' journeys, as beautiful as they are and as important as they are. There's something more. There's something more. And it's enchanted. Oh, and it's right. wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> and it certainly makes life a lot more interesting, doesn't it, when you have that perception. I've found that living in the world of wonder and the world of adventure um, in that childlike state actually allows you to detach from the thing that we identify or we've learned to identify with the most in, in creating that meaning of what life is. It's, um, it certainly changes how we operate in business, how we operate in the, in the real world, um, how we operate in our relationships. Because it's an adventure, we come from a completely different frequency when we do that, don't we? We do. At that point, every story becomes a love story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I love, I absolutely love the part of your book. I read, I read um, the, the excerpt in your book and there's a section in there that totally jumped out at me that I'd like to talk about, like where you talked about the life of a freelancer and you state that, you know, I have to create safety. I have to create safety, trusting that safety found within myself will show up in my experience of the world. And so often we look outside for that validation, bargaining our way, like our security for the things that we love and thinking the net worth equals self-worth and then the entire time, all we need to actually do is look within. It's all, it's all within us. So what do you say to people that would be struggling with this thought paradigm? Because there is a shift that needs to happen from, from one thought paradigm to the next to understand that that creation of safety is within ourselves and the way in which we experience it, like you say, is in, in the world. It's, um, it's challenging to um, say these kinds of things to people um, because they have to be in a place where they are able to hear these things. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it's, you know, it's like a, you look at a plant, you plant a, a, you plant a, a tulip bulb. Mm. Uh, the, what happens with the bulb when it sends out a shoot and then the shoot grows and suddenly there's a calyx, pushes through the dirt and then there's a calyx at the top mm. and mm. then suddenly the calyx bursts and something, <sighs> it's not linear. It isn't linear. We think it's linear. We shoehorn it all into logic and reason. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> And there it is, <laughs> one I prepared earlier. Because <laughs> it's enchanted. <laughs> because every thought ripples across eternity. Mm. And so that's not, you know, we can make that a logic. We can, we can make that very small and logical, but uh, that you have that, and we're talking about that. There's nothing logical about that. Mm. And so... Here this glorious bloom happens. We pretend it's a logical sequence, that the present is the result of the past. But it's not. These things are discrete reality creations. We string them together with our own human consciousness. We make, we make cause leads to effect. And so when we're talking to somebody, and we want to introduce the idea to someone, who is um, at a place that uh, is filled with anxiety or filled with fear or whose safety and security is threatened from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, one has to be at a place in their own growth. You know, if you talk, if you can communicate, if you could communicate to a tulip <laughs> as a bulb and say, you know, you are really a beautiful yellow bloom. <laughs> Yep. There's just no, but as a calyx that is beginning to split, you are really a beautiful yellow blue. It begins to drop in. 
So uh, we can only communicate with people where they are, and people can only communicate with me where I am. Mm. But for those that are um, at a place in their lives where they're willing to understand that safety, self-worth, value, appreciation, care, love, tolerance, the idea that I am loved for who I am, not what I do. Mm. These ideas, when we can understand them to self, not only do they begin to become reflective in our experience of life, but again, back to the enchantment, even bigger. When The more that I know that, the more it's reflected in your life. Mm. The more that I own that, the more it's reflected in your life, in the lives of others. Because it's all a mirror, isn't it? <laughs> One thing. It's all enchanted. It's mm. all a fairy story. <laughs> you know, these fairy stories, they come from somewhere. They come from a deep knowing. Everything is always communicating to us. Yeah. We're always speaking to ourselves. <laughs> they come from someplace. It is an enchantment. Yeah. It is a kingdom of dominion. Yeah. It is. But we have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again to understand that. And so um, there are reasons that it's so difficult. Mm. When we're very little, we, have, we suffer trauma and we suffer injury. We suffer it in ways that uh, are not dealt with simply by um, growing and loving in a linear way and discovering tools like law of attraction and all sorts of things. And those begin to have dramatic impact on our lives, mm. but they will not heal trauma that is so subtle. It's not subtle at all, but to our senses, it's subtle. There are certain... Uh, wounds that we experience even pre-verbally that are not healed until we can come to a place of understanding uh, our true nature of um, our true soulful nature mm. and what happens to that essence when it comes into matter. And these are the last kinds of pieces that get addressed. When those things can get addressed, then you can then say to somebody, if you create safety for yourself, your world will reflect it. But that doesn't have meaning except as a head trip. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Mm. Until you can say to somebody, until I can say to you, to me, when your mother was carrying you, what was going on in her life? Now, you may not know exactly, but you can imagine it because I assure you, your imagination is informed by something. Mm. Was she confident? Was she happy in her marriage? Did she feel good about herself? Uh, did she feel that she um, was equipped and prepared to be a mom? Uh, was she in a good relationship? Did she feel supported by your dad? Did she have um, personal issues? Did she have financial issues? Did she have health issues? Uh, did she have self-worth issues? Was she stressed? Mm. What was going on in her life? Mm. Know that every thought and every feeling that um, mother has, the biochemistry of that is the biochemistry of you and in vitro. It is one martini. <laughs> you're shaken but not stirred <laughs> exactly actually shaken so, martini going on there and this is even before you have the ability to be cognitive and to think about these things so all of her stresses that she could barely handle herself as an adult you as a being without a cognition at this point just pure essence mm. You are taking that on. She could barely handle it. How do you think you did? <laughs> mm. Mm. Before you're even born, 
you are already laid out as a in a matrix of energy movement. And then uh, at a very early age, still before you're, you know, before you're one and a half, two years old, you are still basically um, totally attuned to your mother's energies. Her thoughts are your thoughts. There's no separation. Mm, mm. And so as you begin to develop a cognition, the first thing that happens is the spirit wants to make a cognitive sense. A logic, we now begin the love affair with logic and reason. <laughs> and, they, and, and, and in, comes, in comes the terrible twos, right? <laughs> the terrible twos, and the terrible twos is the... Separation. I'm going to, mm. I am now going to break away. I'm now going to individuate. Oh, my goodness, I'm separate. So you see these little babies, they're two yeah. years old, and they're sitting in their chairs, and they're throwing their plate, their food off the thing, and, <laughs> and you know, it's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what are they doing? At the same time, they are trying to make sense of the um, energies that are locked into their system, which are largely intolerable. Mm. Mm. And they do, it is done in the following way. They make assumptions. We all make assumptions. Everyone makes assumptions about those energies that are intolerable. Mm. It's a miracle we survive these things. It's not the love that we get. That's the beautiful part. It's what happens every time your mom's stressed. Mm. Every time she's in depression, you're taking it on. So we make a story for each one of us begins the adventure into storyland. And the first story we make is an explanation of this intolerable, these intolerable, intolerable body feelings. Mm -hmm. And it always shows up as something like this. It's my fault. I'm not good enough. I'm not loved. I'm not lovable. Mm -hmm. I'm flawed. I'm defective, not worthy of love. There's something wrong with me. I deserve to die. There is, it is something in there, and um, it's unique for everyone, but it is broad, it's both unique and quite similar. Mm -hmm. We now look through these lenses for the rest of our lives. We, it, it is a lens that, through which every experience that we experience for the rest of our life mm -hmm. It's through that. And so if you think back, you'll notice uh, you don't have to look too hard to feel that every time you get triggered by some big event, there is usually at the bottom of it the same sort of hollow feeling in the body someplace mm -hmm. of defectiveness or it's the same, there's the same feeling. Now, when we can get attuned to that and you say to somebody, this is a long answer to a very short I love question. It. I love Keep going. Don't stop. <laughs> when you say, well, how, can, what can you say to somebody about when you love yourself, mm. you find safety from the inside, the world will begin to reflect that safety. And so will the lives of others. Yes. By virtue of your presence will be changed. It is only when you begin to understand uh, this level of the damage, mm. you can skate around the surface of the pond and generate all sorts of beautiful, miraculous things. Yeah. But eventually, it's things. going to top out. Mm. Eventually, everyone who learns tools of metaphysics and spirituality and consciousness we all get excited and we all create miracles and we all totally transform our lives and they become beautiful handcrafted lives, beautiful. <laughs> and ceiling where we hit speed bumps. Yeah. And we go, my goodness, what, what's going on? And now effort starts to happen. Now we begin to have the opportunity to look below the surface and to what is it about myself that really, now I can begin to, to turn inward and find the part that can be healed. We've all heard about loving, loving the shadow and loving the inner child, but we don't really know. It's conceptual. Mm. Oh, love the inner child. What are we really talking about there? Mm. We're really talking about uh, the, what I'm speaking about and other, th and other considerations at that level. Now we are really talking about something that is no longer conceptual. Mm. Now you understand that if I was to go back 
in meditation or in a walking meditation or in a moment of being triggered and I was able to say to, to that aspect of myself that still exists because every version of us that ever was or ever will be exists now. There is no such thing as time. We string time together like pearls on a, on a, on a necklace. This is all the post-heroic journey. This is all the journey of wonder and enchantment. So everything happens now. That means that I am reacting now to a story of self from the past, and I can heal that past because it's all now. Now I begin to understand what it means to love myself. So that little child overwhelmed with energies, none of which were her own, none of which were his own, all of which were my mother's, some of which at birth became my father's, some of which is generational, six and seven generations back, passing on themes, mm. passing same stories, the same triggers, the same patterns, the same recipes. Yeah. Now I have the ability to go back and say the kinds of things to that little infant and it's real, it's no longer conceptual, to say to them, this was never yours. I love you, my dear, this was never yours. This was a lie you told yourself. Any little boy or girl who had a mother, who had a mother, they weren't bad, they did the best they could. Mm. But the consciousness starts here, they didn't have the consciousness. Mm. The consciousness starts with me. Any little girl who had a mother, who had a mother, who didn't have the benefit of being able to be attuned emotionally to her mother, much less to me, would have had those feelings and would have made that story. Yeah. But it's true, because what's true is you are beautiful, mm. and you are good, and you are true. And I will take care of you, and I will meet your needs, mm. and my love will heal you. Mm. And you are not wonderful for what you do but only because you exist. Mm. And by me, you will come home. That is what Jesus meant when he said, suffer the little children. He wasn't talking about urchins in the sand. It was your own inner own. children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, long answer to a short question. <laughs> That's okay. I've got a few long questions coming up. <laughs> we'll, we'll balance it all out. <laughs> Hope that was helpful. That was wonderful. Thank you. Now, now on um, the nature of doing versus being, um, mm. it's interesting. It's for me, it's an interesting yet really delicate balance. And uh, you know, with the fast-paced, hardwired world, plugged-in world that we live in, often too much doing can be the undoing of us. And we're so switched on. We're on a constant state of noise. We're always in flight or flight mode. Um, but the thing that fasc fascinates me most is. What does it serve at a subconscious level when we hear that notification sound or that that uh, you know um, that that beep uh, from the phone? Are we turning into a society of Pavlov's dogs, being that we hear the notification in the, in the digital service and then instantly it salivates those neural pathways that long for yeah. that basic human desire to be loved and accepted? So, can there be a balance between the doing and the being with a deeper subconscious agenda of the basic need for that acceptance and how do we interlace the two in order to balance that balance harmoniously in a world where it's challenged every minute uh, that question is the, is the most brilliant question and you you actually answered it <laughs> we often ask well, if we know the question we know the answer don't we <laughs> so beautifully presented you. uh, because you're uh, you're quite right the Pavlovian response is a response, is a triggering of the subconscious pattern. Mm. Then and our memory, these subconscious memory patterns are memories, and memories are neural, neural maps. Mm. Yeah. Um, a, a neural structure that is, that is woven in a particular pattern is a memory. Mm. Because it is habituated, it looks like a piece of textile when you, when you look at how the energy flows, and it is because the memory keeps going there, it triggers the same biochemistry and we have, it is a neural map. And so you're absolutely right. They become self-reinforcing loops. Then you went on and you said, well, we, but we're actually craving 
an emotional attunement. Mm. The emotional attunement is your limbic brain. Your limbic brain is the second brain to develop. The first was the reptilian fight or flight brain. Then comes the emotional brain. Mm. The emotional brain has no cognition, intellectual cognition. It is entirely emotive, viscera, body viscera, mm. and connection. And then comes the third brain, the neocortex brain, the thinking and the doing brain. Your being brain is your limbic brain. Mm. So okay. like Pavlov's dog, we hear the ding and we want to go right into doing. Mm. The doing brain uh, does not have the capacity. It is not wired. It is like, it is like asking a cat to bark. <laughs> the doing brain does not have the capacity to meet any emotional needs. Mm. The doing brain will not make you human. Yeah. My girlfriend often brain, calls it the monkey brain. <laughs> it's the monkey brain. That's the one that is constantly doing this over and over yeah. that we can't turn off. We keep hearing it and we go into meditative practices and we can somewhat mitigate it, but not entirely. Yeah, yeah. Because we're trying to mitigate it by a doing. Mm, mm. Right. It's not doing that we. You will not, as Einstein said, you won't. You know, you won't handle. You won't respond to consciousness out of the same in a new way out of the same consciousness that I'm, I'm blowing it. But you know what I'm yeah, talking about. I know about. what you mean. Yes, yes. The same level of we can't solve the same problem with the same level of consciousness that we had to create it. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So we will not find emotional attunement. Mm. From our third, from our new brain, it, mm. that is not what it's there for. It's there to do shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's there to build buildings and to open uh, to open businesses yeah. and to drive kids to carpool. <laughs> and it's to 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 make wonderful things and yeah. write books and make movies and the uh, attunement the connection, the appreciation of, uh, of a lover, of a flower, of a child, of a cloud, cannot be handled by that, by that third brain. So we know lots of over-functioning psychopaths. We have evidence of them turn on the news. Mm. When we hear the um, bell ring, we understand that that is my conditioned doing brain. Someone that is emotionally mature, spiritually mature, understands there's a time to put childish things away. Mm. And um, the nurturing of the being state, that's the container. That's mm. the, that is where the, the feminine principle resides there. The willingness, the container, the womb, the womb that is pregnant with all possibility mm. resides in the being state. Mm. The will and action that fills the being state, that builds the building, that fills the womb, yeah. the doing, that is masculine energy, which largely has run amok. It's not entirely integrated, but we don't need to get into that in this call. Mm. Oh, we'll do it next time. Yeah. <laughs> I used to say, doing is beautiful. Mm. You need to find a balance. But uh, the feminine energy, the womb of all possibility and all creativity, the womb that is so spacious and so generous that it will even make space for the psychotic, out of control doing. Yeah, you want to do that? Sure, I'll make space for that too. You want to do it for 5,000 years of the straight line? Sure, we'll do that too. <laughs> with, with however long it takes. Until that you is, get it. <laughs> it's not time bound uh, in the way that the doing brain is. The doing brain is running on a clock. Yeah. So the, um, the, the spiritually sophisticated um, person begins to make distinctions between what is uh, empowered doing and what is the vanity of doing. Mm. 
do I really give a shit about being a millionaire? Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, that, the attention in our community <laughs> on the millionaire thing is psychotic. It is, isn't it? It is, the, it is like um, uh, um, how, uh, what's his name? The I Am producer, how he's, he puts it beautifully in the movie I Am Sh uh, Shaddai. Oh. Sh how do you say his surname? Oh. Tom, Tom, yeah. The way that he puts it is, is just I, eloquently beautiful that that's mental illness. <laughs> it is mental illness. It's literally mental illness. I'm not yeah. even being pejorative here. It is let mental illness because it's all here in the front. Mm. And it has no feminine energy to it. Mm. And if we don't bring, if we don't begin to pull those together again, we will be we will be in for an increasingly difficult time. Yeah. Do you, Do you think that like the pet, in the masculine and feminine on a universal level, you know, where the pendulum needs to I suppose swing both ways, we're very much in the masculine. Uh, do you, Do you think that we're going to go like too much into the feminine and then find our place in the middle? No. In, no. Because it's not linear. Mm. It is the front brain that thinks in terms of of strategies. Mm -hmm. Your lithic brain, your attunement, no mother thinks in those terms. Mm. No mother is thinking. It is a visceral... Remember, go back to where we began the conversation. The limbic brain comes on. You're in utero. The limbic brain is starting to form. You're taking on all of this stuff, all of the cognitions that are, that there is no cognition, there is no cognitive brain in yourself as a, as a in utero infant. Mm. So you take all of that anxiety and all of that stuff and it's being processed straight into the body, into the cellular system, straight into the womb of who you are and it's mm. being held. Mm. So um, eventually we, find ways to release that mm -hmm. we don't really release it we just make our we soothe ourselves in this sort of um we soothe ourselves with our stories but that's only when the cognitive brain starts to come on You're right. yeah. but now we want to begin to create not a balance right mm -hmm. so pregnancy is not about a balance yeah <laughs> this is true it's a <laughs> That's, it's not a masculine, it's not a male or female thing, it's a masculine energy and a feminine energy thing. It's not, it's not a gender thing. Mm -hmm. The logic, the cause leading effect, the, the love affair with logic and reason, balancing, mm -hmm. that, is, that is a neocortex, that is a new brain. Yeah. That is okay. not what it's about. Yeah. So it's about is let's now, let's now, now, now heal what mm -hmm. happened to the limbic relation our limbic relationship let's heal that and let's make it sophisticated and let's heal the being inside that abandoned ship literally had to abandon that because it was so painful yeah so let's heal that and when that is healed it's more of a braiding of energies mm. than of energies mm. Mm. think of the hex in the dna yeah yeah it's more of a braid not even that, but it's a more accurate metaphor, but the metaphors fall short because we do not have the equipment yes. to calibrate <laughs> and the humility that is required to let that in. We're at a place where we do not have to make sense of the world. Mm. The trying to make sense of the world keeps us in a world of nonsense <laughs> the world is, will not we will not outthink the world mm. we will not out life yeah and desire to shoehorn all experience into the frontal lobe is um the moving past that is the transformational invitation mm. not a challenge unless we want to make it a challenge it's mm. only this piece of meat on the front that wants to make a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. To be pregnant with the possibility of life itself. Love it. Mm. Now, well, you know, any mother falls in love with a child long before it's born. Yes. 
we're we have an opportunity to fall in love with a reality that is beyond. We don't have any apparatus to perceive it or conceive it from here, mm. any more than the bulb of your tulip yeah. could have any sense of itself as a bloom. Mm. But we have enough going on, both intellectually to know beyond logic and reason. Logic and reason and my thinking ability is not the end of all reality, unless I'm that arrogant to think it is. And then, okay, that's developmental. Yeah. But is, is what I can conceive of or, or grok scientifically, is that the boundary line of all reality? Or is it more likely the boundary line of my control? my ego control. Well, yeah. I'm just throw that out for consideration. Yeah. Love it. Uh, that I can even have the tune into the question and feel what that question is like in my body. And as I do that right now, and I invite you to do it now too, our listeners too, but I'm inviting you to do it. Mm. Where in your body do you feel that question? Is there more to your being than what you can figure out in your mind. Mm. Where in your body do you feel that question? In my heart. Okay. Mm. And I'm tuning into you and I also feel there's a, I'm, I'm intuiting and if I'm wrong, mm. say so. There's a tightness around just below your neck. It's a mm. little tight. Yeah. You don't have to make a, a set a lot. You don't have to put together, and that means. We want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> there is no, and that means. There is only the tuning into, I'm tight. Yeah, yeah. What is the experience? What is the experience? Just allow yourself to have the experience without making a story out of it. Mm. Have the experience of, I'm tight. And that experience will move. You will release energy. It'll move into something else. Mm -hmm. End of story. No story involved. <laughs> no story. No <laughs> meaning attached. Just is. <laughs> no meaning attached. Yeah. Now, how is that going to um, make sense in terms of way, in ways that we can relate? We don't know. But this is the. We're now talking about the edge of an awakening. Mm -hmm to a sense of our connection to an enchanted being state. Yeah. That I can, on the other side of the world, tune in to the tightness in your neck. Mm -hmm. And you can, in, into what's going on in me, if you give yourself the space, you can. Yeah. Yeah. If you allow your intellect to intrude. So, um... All that to say, it's not about will we swing back to too much feminine energy. Yes. Um, yes. For people that are committed to a head trip, some of those people will. Yeah, yeah. They're going to say, well, the men have had it, so we're going to give it to the women. You know, <laughs> that's not at all what we're talking about. And no. there will be people that, that for whom that uh, is reality, and that's fine. That's where they are. I'm, I'm not here to get them off that game. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to um, have a chat with you about something that came up with um, a discussion with a friend of mine being the paradox of compassion versus the soul's integrity. And as we in the, individually, as we embark upon this consciously aware journey in life, we're taught all about compassion and kindness, and which, which my friend does practice every single day. However, she was faced with a dilemma where she would practice compassion on, let's say, a, uh, a person who has a disempowering or toxic energy. And she has to decide what's more important, her soul's integrity or practicing compassion. And then it got me thinking, if we go with the soul's integrity, then are we truly practicing compassion in its purest form? And how does, how does a person practice true compassion while still maintaining the soul's integrity? Well, um, I love that. What we are usually taught when we are taught compassion is uh, what psychologists call agency. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, I'll tell you a little story. You, yeah. you, have, bar you have Barbie dolls there, right? Yes. 
imagine a little story about a, a little girl and all she wants is a Barbie doll. She wants a Barbie doll. I want a Barbie. I want the Barbie. I want the Malibu Barbie in the pink Mustang with Ken and the surfboards on the rack. And I want that. I, want, I just want it. And her parents are very politically correct. And they just think, oh, I just, they, her parents think it's not the image that we want for our daughter. And it's sexist. And her parents have all sorts of progressive, liberal progressive. And so they go out. It comes her birthday. They come, she comes in and there's this big box and she knows it's a Barbie. It's the Barbie with the Mustang and the G. And she's got it. And she tears it open. And it's not. It's a little uh, squeeze me spirit doll. And uh, she's heartbroken. Mm. But she knows that um, she knows that she needs to make her mommy and her daddy happy. Because she's little, and we're trained very little that if we, if we make our caregivers happy, uh, we will be safe. Mm. But if we disappoint our caregivers, um, they may judge us, they may withhold love, they may be disappointed. I'm only a little girl. If my mommy and my daddy, they may think I'm not a good person. Mm. So I put on a happy face. And I say, I love my little squeezy spirit doll, spiritual girl doll. I just love her. But inside, I'm hollow. So uh, that is called agency. And we uh, become very, very skilled at it, every one of us. We're taught from a very early age that uh, we will be um, better served to make other people happy. So you're going out to dinner with your mate, and he says, uh, where should we go to dinner? And uh, you say, I don't know, will you pick? I mean, you know you'd rather have Italian, you know it, but you won't say it. Say, what do you want? Whatever you want. What movie should we Whatever you want. Unless, you know, unless there's like a real different vertical thing in your relationship that somebody that's constantly giving away power to you, and you know, one of these people who are like, just, uh, I just want to hang with you, Tanil, then, you know, then you have no problem saying, I want to go to this movie. And they say, how about that movie? And you say, no. <laughs> Usually, we are all about trying to curry the good favor of others. Mm. And it's taught to us as compassion. It's not compassion. Mm. Um, compassion can only be expressed inside of the soul's integrity. So the soul's integrity is a natural boundary that says, this is who I am and this is what I stand for. Mm. Inside of my boundary, I have an appreciation for what you're going through or you're going through or you're going through. I understand it. I don't need to condone it. I don't need to like it. I understand it. Yeah. There is nowhere in compassion that says I have to be goody-goody about it. <laughs> That's agency. Yes, yes, okay. Compassion is an active caring for others that is born out of personal suffering, which means I have been through hell yeah. or I've been through a difficult time, and so I understand what another difficult time is right now. For example, there is um, all these psychopaths in, the, in Iraq and Syria, these ISIS people. Mm -hmm. These people are psychopaths. Now, I have uh, a compassion. That doesn't mean that I like them. That doesn't mean that I love them. That doesn't mean that I uh, am excusing anything. It means that I have an understanding of uh, the hell they must be in. What are they getting out of this behavior? Yeah. This psychopathic, murderous behavior. What are they getting out of it? They are getting certain spiritual uh, benefits. Mm. They have a sense of mission. We all want a sense of mission. Yeah. They have a sense of belonging. We all want to belong. <laughs> they have a sense of fraternity, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. We all want that. So they were not in a situation where they could receive an integrated version of it. Mm. Or after that, what pulls them into this band that they have a great mission that they were told. They have no sophistication and they have no personal volition. 
but they are they are bound together uh, out of a spiritual need. These are spiritual gifts: connection, communion, community, great mission, great purpose in the world. These are spiritual gifts. Mm-hmm. The most the most uh, psychotic experience of them, but they are spiritual gifts. I understand that. I have compassion for what's going on. I have contempt for how it is being expressed. And that compassion does not mean I condone or endorse anything. Mm, mm. It means I understand it. I understand the damage you do, and I care about it. And uh, I do send energy for the healing of that there and in myself and in others because it doesn't always show up as psychotic behavior sometimes mm. it shows up as agency sometimes it shows up as a parent who th- gives his daughter a Susie spiritual doll instead of a Barbie doll yeah. because um, you know is that a is that a a, a generous open hearted gift if the parent model values in the living of their own life, models values of respect for another person, respect for their own feminine nature, meaning their own limbic attunement. How do you respect your own feminine nature? The, the computer dings and I don't rush to answer it then Barbie will take care of itself. And if my daughter wants a Barbie, you freaking give her a Barbie doll because she's four years old and she deserves to have that. Mm-hmm. That's where she is intellectually. Yeah. But if she grows up in a house where, where feminine energies are lived, which is an emotional attunement, it's not just doing the right thing. Mm. It's be- they're being states. <laughs> then that can have the Barbie not feel she has to develop an agency habit. Yeah, yeah. And in in the fullness of time, she will move into an attunement, uh, a discovery of what a mature um, feminine expression is. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. There's a little girl, she can have a Barbie. (laughs) Give the girl a Barbie. (laughs) So... Uh, is that helpful? Does that yeah, answer that? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so the next sort of thing that I want to chat with you about is we're seeing people, uh, well, I, I feel like we're seeing people more dropping into their hearts a lot more than what they have before um, in this time period of our lives. And we're consciously beginning to program our subconscious where we've been able to, and I've I've heard you say that before, where we've had access to more educational information outside of the for-profit media. What we're seeing is in Mother Earth is that, you know, I feel that the frequency of Mother Earth is is increasing and leaving behind those who cannot raise with it. So why do you think we're having, first off, this elevation in consciousness? And my thought is, are we just going back to what we already were? Is it cyclical in nature this whole no no this is new Mm. Um, there has not been a human experience uh, even where we are now this is virgin this is virgin territory this is new Um, this is uh, evolutionary this is I don't know how far out uh, our listeners want to get. And so, <laughs> let's go. But <laughs> let's test the boundaries. Come on. Let's ha- we'll have a bit of fun with them. <laughs> uh, this is not the first of the human experiments on this planet. Mm-hmm. This is one that is succeeding, however. And many of us, particularly in this community, uh, this is not our first time um, mm-hmm. at bat here. Um, there was the Lemurian experiment there was, which succeeded and moved into the mists. And uh, many of us uh, chose not to move into the mists. Uh, there was the, um, there was the four Atlantean experiments. Yes. 
and um, most of the leader or, or leaders, I don't mean that as vertical, I just mean the people that are out in front of, of, um, of uh, the community of consciousness these days have, uh, are, all, um, are, are all out of a Atlantean tradition. For every one of us, myself included, certainly you, Mm -hmm. um, not all of those Atlantean experiments failed. Actually, they all succeeded. Um, there were those who had chicken little, the sky is falling. Yeah. And uh, for them, it failed. And we were amongst those. <laughs> um, we were the ones who created failure, who, who created uh a failure there in very constrictive realities and um but more people and this is just the nature of um the paradox of reality is that it is not either or there are as many realities as you can conceive of and as many versions of you occupying each one as you can conceive of and well beyond that the distinction is this is the reality in which your consciousness resides this is where you're seated yes um and um, you can move it in meditative practices and in dream state. You can move it, but this is where it's rooted. And so we, uh, in, this, in this experiment, we, uh, we have succeeded. We've already succeeded. And we are on a brand new, this is all virgin territory. This has not been experienced before, mm. ever. And um, we are creating something brand new here. Mm. So um, that's unequivocal. Yeah. That's not a maybe. We're not returning to some idealized past experienced by, um, by um, 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 civilizations or cultures, um, indigenous peoples. Yeah. That's all of which is beautiful and no more or less beautiful than the um, cultures that were generated by um, technological or, or other cultures. Everybody has worked through their own themes and their own patterns. What is unique here is that in, uh, an, in a number of individuals, it is coming together not as a balance, but as a constellation of energies. Mm. That are being held consciously. Yeah. We are not simply programming our subconscious. We are awakening to the understanding that we are consciously moving through our subconscious. Hmm. You want to see your cub subconscious? You're looking at him. Mm. Turn around, look out the window. You're looking at your subconscious. So you are not programming um, a um, software in a computer. Yeah. You are, what we call programming is coming into an attunement with energy frequencies that are being expressed both outside and inside. It's the same place. Mm. We are consciously moving through our subconscious and our unconscious. Eyes open. We are becoming not lucid dreamers, lucid livers. <laughs> I love it. That's yes. what's going on here. This is new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. So, what what, what about the? I often hear like the you know the soul and the spirit terms that we throw around a bit. How I I and I, and I've had um, one of my friends as well ask the question. You know, what is the difference between the soul and the spirit, and how do they integrate? together and what is the purpose of each you have one soul mm. your soul you have many many lives all now yeah so, you know it's like you take out the top of the pepper and empty it out and each one they're all now yeah we have we pull out one grain of pepper and it's a life and then we lead it and they're all now we put we, we we put them on different time tracks futures and past but they're all now this planet that planet this experience that experience they're all now they're they're all 
the whole pepper is dumped on your table. <laughs> we have bunches of lives. Yeah. Higher selves, lower selves, they're all different perspectives and um, points of view of our own energy. Mm. All now. And they are all held by your soul, which is your lens, which is the lens to God. It's lens to the next level of consciousness, a level of consciousness that is so superseding, we call it God. Mm. Beyond anything that we can humanly, the lens between what we can begin to sort of, not quite grok, but... And that is the soul. Right. So wow. it, is, it is a container, a womb, feminine, feminine energy, that holds us. Mm. The spirit, the spirit is masculine energy, mm -hmm. pure joy, pure joy. And it is the flicker, the flame. Think of it as a um, bad analogy, but think of it as the, as the ecstatic sperm. <laughs> Your soul is monumental. Yeah. The spirit is a flicker and delicate, delicate, delicate. You can blow out that spirit. Mm. We have blow it out in every life, somewhere around... 9 to 14, 15, we have a moment called the wounding where the spirit, with a time where we think we can do anything, we can ride bikes and we can do anything, we can go to, we go to college, we can, like, we can party three days straight and eat pizza and drink like 15 cases of beer and then drive home. Yeah. And somehow we think we can do anything and then something happens. It could be an enormous thing, it could be a tiny thing a rejection, a disappointment, and then the pilot light is blown out. Mm. And do you remember in your own life when that happened? Mm. Mm -hmm. to everyone. And then starts what is called the shadow years, where we put together, first is a, a spirituality that's given to us, presets. Yes. The spirit is blown out. It's extinguished. Yeah. The soul holds all of this. We start the shadow years. We are lonely. It's difficult. Yeah. And we start to cobble together our own sense of who we are. For many, it doesn't work. For that's more often the death that we die. That's how they say it, the philosophy of dying your own death while you're still alive. That's exactly it. Yeah. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, Dante, midway through my life's journey, I came to a place in a dark wood and the way was totally lost. So this is, is referring to, you know, the shadow years start when that wound happens and they usually go till around 50 years. It's a long time. And then you have uh, a life crisis or the midlife crisis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You look back on your life and many try and they long for the good old days. They were never good, but they long for them. They tell them that, you know, and we do that as individuals. And we do it as cultures, too. Right now, there's a whole part of the world that is longing for the 14th century. Yeah. Um, and if we have, so we look back or we look forward. And we, if we look forward and we have enough of our own spirituality built, that we can now look forward into chaos without it having to be negative chaos. It can be beautiful chaos. Mm. We have enough of our own spirituality built so that we can meet the uncertainty in the moment. Then we have a recipe for joy. That's the midlife crisis. Mm. Mm. Um, this, uh, these are all the building back of spirit, of igniting our own spirit, our own masculine, integrated masculine energy. What makes it integrated? It makes it integrated because it is attuned, it is in a love affair with soul. And so soul expressed in ourselves, in each individual, is first held by that limbic brain. Yeah. Our emotions, our connection, our bodies, 
are individual bodies, and then the awareness of my body is also your body. My body is also the body of my community. It's the body of my planet. Do I need to go fight for it? No, I just need to love it. So now I'm firing up. I'm making that, that, I'm making that spirit, that delicate, delicate spirit. It's so delicate. It can get blown out so easily. It's so fragile, but it's so alive and it's so full of joy and it dances like the sparks and fireworks. And we pump it up and we blow it up and the soul has been waiting, has been waiting to be found by spirit and spirit is longing and searching for soul. It's a love affair. Mm. Build it and we build it and we build it and we build this beautiful relationship with spirit, our masculine energy that is a love affair with the feminine. We build it from a tiny, tiny flame into a bonfire, French for a bon feu, a good fire. A fire. Mm. So now we have a fire built in the leading, living of our lives that is filling the space held by the soul, by the feminine energy. When that happens, no more incarnations. Mm. What do you think happens it, after that? Once we've done the incarnations, we've done the soul's journey. We go on. There's more. Yeah. Yeah. There's more. Mm, it's fascinating. In some ways, I feel like we're not meant to know. <laughs> oh, we can't know from here. Not from here, yeah. Begin to know. We can begin to know. Um, whereas we start to pay attention to the body sensations without making stories out of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when you were asleep at night, you have these dreams, but you're not there. So when you think back on them, they're stories when you're living through them, but you're not clinging to the stories. You're not, you're not making a whole narrative out of them. Mm, mm, yeah. You're just living through them. Yeah. It's a little bit and, like Eckhart Tolle's, um, version of how he says space consciousness, where we find that space, um, of sensing a stillness in the background while the life goes on in the foreground. And yes. I often feel that sense where I ask myself, what movie is this going to be today? You know, am, am I watching a drama? Am I watching a romantic comedy? Am I directing the show? Or am I just a method actor in the character that I've created, identifying with it so much that I trick myself into thinking that it's actually reality? <laughs> um, I feel yeah. like yeah. as humans we do, we attach that kind of meaning for a life without meaning is going to be a, a life with no characters in the movie. So stepping from that space consciousness, how, how do we step into that space consciousness realm or thought, you know, without buying into the story? Is it, well, is it possible? It is possible. I mean, the part that buys into the story will always buy into the story. Mm. But before we, that's the part, uh, that's the part of you that wants the Barbie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, there is a part of me that still likes fast cars and is yeah. 10 years old and had a car and we'd go vroom, 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 vroom with my toy cars. Yeah. And then when I was like 30 years old, drove a Porsche, vroom, 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 vroom. <laughs> and, and now, you know, it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't, I have other interests and it doesn't, these things don't move me in the same way because mm -hmm. there are other things that move me. Mm -hmm. So, um, the part that wants to make story doesn't need to be fought or suppressed, it's just loved. The part that doesn't make story is the limbic part. Mm. The soul is not making story. Spirit mm. makes story. But <laughs> spirit, even spirit doesn't make story. Um, our cognition makes story. Spirit is not making story. Uh, we just we attune to spirit easier than we attune to the feminine uh, because we are at war with the feminine. Um, we are at war with, with uh, knowing, we are at war with creativity, and we are at war with anything that we cannot control through logic and reason. Mm. Or we are at war with uh, the divine feminine principle. And it gets expressed all the way down to war with women. Mm. A degree to which we are uncomfortable with our own willingness to feel without attaching a story. 
is the degree to which uh, we will be champions of chauvinism, notwithstanding uh, however politically correct we are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. We are unconscious of the body expression without putting a bunch of story on it. Um, then we do. Then we will. We automatically um, are proponents of chauvinism. Mm. Mm. So you can have a Barbie because I know better. Yeah. That's that's violent to a little girl. Mm. Mm. What would you say to people that um, when you say like if if we said to my you know this is all an illusion what we're in. And obviously, there's got to be a certain level of uh, being ready to hear that information. The, you know, the delicate nature of the frequencies that need to be right at the right time to go. Ah, okay, I'm, I'm with you. How? But how would you explain to someone that what we're in is an is an illusion? Um, it's a very real illusion when we're in it. Yeah. When I was. The more that we are reliant only on logic and reason, the denser the illusion. Mm. So when we are completely fixated on logic and reason, it's very, very difficult. And that applies still to people who are interested in spirituality because they are very often, they are looking for tools in spirituality to uh, get the girl, to get the car, to get the job, to get the million dollars. So there is still uh, an egoic agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm not making it bad. I am pointing out that it's developmental. Yeah. Eventually, you want to mature past that. It's a love story. Mm. <laughs> it's a love story. Uh, it's a love story. Did I say it was a love story? <laughs> it's a love story. <laughs> There's more to it than mm. satisfying those things. Um, that is why those things is beautiful in the way that you give the little girl the Barbie doll. Yeah, yeah. Because if you give it to her and then you are living um, a healing life, mm. understanding the role of doing and understanding the role of being, emoting, if you're really living into that at some point, you are, everybody outgrows the Barbie doll. And That's when I grow at the Barbie doll, you will outgrow the Barbie doll because I create it all. And then I don't. But that part is beyond me. <laughs> so, um, the dreamy nature of it becomes increasingly obvious as you start to become attuned to the body and uh, not just the heart. Because lots of times when people talk about the heart, what they're referring to is um, is a gushy sentimentality. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of people, I'm, I'm sure, I know lots of gushy people and they think that they're very much in their heart and they're just gushy. They're sentimental. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing, uh, the heart is a fierce place. It's freaking fierce. Mm -hmm. Nothing cute or gushy about it. It'll fry you. It's an energy. <laughs> so, it short wires you sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> that, so, um, you know, we um, infantilize that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We infantilize feminine energy. We infantilize integrated masculine energy spirit. It's a fire. <laughs> it's not sweet. <laughs> it's, this is not kid stuff. <laughs> yeah. Remove us, the ferocity of it. The ferocity of love removes us from uh, being intimate and close and tender with it. It removes us. And the more intimate you are with the ferocity of it, the more obviously dreamy it is. It's so obviously dreamy. Things can change in the most non-linear, illogical, just logic goes out the window. Things just can move. There's nothing in your life that can't entirely be different in three days. Yeah. So um, the more that uh, we are 
married to understanding and knowing and making a story out of everything. Uh, the more that we are um, sentimentalizing the heart, the mm. uh, less likely we are to experience the ferocity of it because it is, it's uh, frightening people. It frightens them because the control goes out the window. Mm. Mm. Much now like we, falling in love with someone that you just, it's instant. It's just, um, and there's no logic. It's beyond yeah, control. And across everything. Mm. Mm. That, usually when we fall in love, we are falling in love and we often surrender our autonomy. We often are falling in love with denied projections of things. But imagine that you are falling in love consciously. Mm -hmm. No part of you is in agency. Lots of times when we fall in love, we're doing agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm on my best behavior because I want you to see how great I am so you'll like me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right, oh, yeah. Now it's full. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm going to be like nothing like I usually am with you. <laughs> so that so you'll like me. Um, but imagine that none of that is happening and that you're not only falling in love with another person, you're falling in love with everyone and everyone is falling in love with you and everything, every tree, mm -hmm. every, and that the world is responding to your emotional states, less to your doing. Doing is, that's the spirit piece. That's for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three things. We're here to consciously learn to create success. Mm -hmm. And that's a developmental thing. At some point, it's driving a car or having a Barbie. Yeah, yeah. Not a spirit, though. <laughs> At some point, it's uh, having a great job, a great spouse, a great family, making a million dollars. Mm. And at some point, it is success means the bounty and prosperity of the connection, of the knowing of the nature of the enchantment, and that you and me are one thing. Yeah. yeah. And what I think and say and do shows up in you, mm -hmm. and vice versa. When I know that, it's wild and dreamy. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, that, so the, the third thing of, that we're here to do, and to be, is to learn how to have fun. Yes. The thing is about fun. Yeah. The whole of creation is in ecstasy, except <laughs> us. <laughs> and I suppose the creativity piece is that vehicle to induce that fun, isn't it? Which is what you do in your book with, your, uh, with the book of doing and being. Yeah, that's mm. exactly it. The, we're so estranged from it. We have such a... We have such a a reduced understanding of the nature of fun. It's even considered like intellectually dubious because it is, right? Because this part's not having fun. Yeah, yeah. This part is trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. So, um, and control. So uh, we and we think, well, creativity is, you know, people that want to sing and want to dance and make pots and make circuses and make symphonies. They don't know that creativity is what we are engaged in twenty four seven. Creativity is love's work. There is nothing else going on in, on the planet mm. except activity. And if your life is a shambles, that's a creative act. It's yeah. not an empowered creative act, but it's highly creative act. Yeah. So to understand the mechanics of the creative act so that we can get to a place of understanding that I do create it all, mm -hmm. so that we can get to the place that we talked about earlier, when I really get that I create it all, then the big, big game starts in, oh, I don't? <laughs> <laughs> wow! Like, oh, my oh my god! That's now we're in the real the real stuff. Now the real fun begins. <laughs> now it starts. Now we begin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the place that humans have never been. Yes. Yeah. We have a uh, tradition. There have been plenty of uh, civilizations that have gotten not effectively, but gotten close to. Oh, I do create it all. Mm -hmm. we've, many, we've had many people who have been enlightened in the world that realized I do create my own reality. But, um, and now I don't. We haven't seen too much of that. We've never seen it as a, we've never seen it, we've never seen it as a, as a mass experiment. We have never seen what we are seeing now. This has never happened. 
It's a great time and to be alive. <laughs> so, uh, right now, uh, we're the focus of a lot of attention of consciousness, human and non-human, a lot of attention, mm -hmm. a lot of love, a lot of support, a lot of interest, a lot of excitement. It has never happened before. Mm. Human creatures have never consciously evolved. No one has ever gone from a tulip bulb to a blossom with their eyes open. Yes. Never happened. Yeah. Never happened. Yeah. Mm. So let's talk about how people can find out <laughs> more about what you're doing. What's the, what's the, um, what are the connections? How can they connect with you with, with this? I mean, obviously after watching this, I'm sure they're all just like, <laughs> so how do they, how do they find out more about your book, about what you're doing um, and what's coming up for you? So uh, God, lots is coming up. First of all, I really enjoyed this time with you, and I hope we'll do it again. I loved Love it. To, I yeah. loved it. Wonderful. You're wonderful. Thank you. And, um, so you can find more out about me at www.barnettbain.com. Yeah. Um, the book is called The Book of Doing and Being, and it'll be in bookstores um, in the U.S. and Canada, probably in Australia too, actually, because it's Simon & Schuster, and they bought it for Australia too, July 7th. And... Um, Many of you will be listening to this long after July 7th. And for those of you who aren't, that want to pre-order, you can pre-order it now on my site or, or any of your, um, any of the places online that you buy books or in your bookstores. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm prepping a movie that we'll shoot in September called Milton's Secret. Which is um, how, how is that all coming along? I, I, I remember listening to one of your broadcasts that there was a bit of a... Uh, you were in a, in a bit of a uh, um, challenge with it. Is it. How's it all coming along? Well, now it is. It's been a challenge because it's, it was, it's, a subject, it's a subject that's unfamiliar to people. Yes. And it is a kind of a story about themes and issues that I, didn't full, that I had a sense of, but I wasn't clear enough in myself that I could turn them into a story. How do you make a story out of, out of something that cannot be made a story out of? <laughs> Stand it myself. The ultimate, the ultimate challenge. <laughs> and I've made some movies in the past that I know that some of our listeners are familiar with anyway. Yeah. That um, dealt with esoteric themes and and. Um, I haven't been, I, although I've loved these films, they haven't been as successful as I would like because they uh, felt like tutorials sometimes. And that's developmentally where we were. Right. We right. had an idea of these things and, and a lot of enthusiasm, but not enough grounded maturity to be able to um, live them out and so create them as art in models without having to get on a soapbox. It's like people who say, you know, stop smoking. <laughs> um, so this movie is about presence and uh, the way we pass stress on to each other in uh, subtle, subtle ways. And um, it's about a little boy and his parents have financial problems and marital problems and they treat themselves like objects they're in overwork and in stress all the time and all of their behaviors look really normal mm. they just look so normal <laughs> and um and it's obvious why the boy is neurotic his parents are neurotic yes. um, but we look we think these are normal behaviors and then we try to fix the boy but the boy is you know it's like putting um it's like putting um, dinner into the microwave <laughs> and turning the microwave on and then you know you yell at the dinner because it's overcooked I mean it's yeah, a yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. great analogy <laughs> that's kind of you know we do that all over our culture everywhere mm. in the culture we um, we see problems and we try and fix problems and we don't understand we don't understand our relationship our our very personal relationship to everything that is both beautiful and good and true in the world. 
and everything that we can elevate as well that, that could use elevation. We don't understand our impact and we don't understand our relationship to it because we live, we crunch everything down mm. into logic and into reason. And as long as we do that, we will not grow into the awareness um, of the poetry of life, of our lives, and that we are, we are ourselves the poets. Mm. Mm. So that's what the movie is. Mm. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> well, I'll put all the links in for people to, um, that, that are interested in seeing that, and um, yeah, we can't wait. September, <laughs> so you'll see it in, um, we'll see it next year. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much for gracing us with your time and, um, you know, and, and giving us all that amazing brain food that's just going to be turning over my head all day today. It's been such a stimulating discussion and um, um, really insightful. And so thank you so much. And, yeah, I do hope we can do it again when, when things are – when you've got another project coming up or if you've got something else that, you know, just to be a messenger of, of, of what it is that you that – you, yeah, uh, you know, you give to the world and is extremely priceless. And if I can play a, a role in that, then um, I'd be absolutely honoured. So thank you so much for all of your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.